All right, excellent. So as I um, mentioned a few times online, it's not my first time in Hong Kong, it's my first time for work though. So I'm really excited to be here professionally that I didn't have to pay for my flights myself for once. Uh, but I, I do love Hong Kong very much and uh, we've had uh, the chance to walk around the beach yesterday and uh, to go to uh, pray in the temple for the success of our team, which was fun. And, um, and then we went to the bird, you know, on the, in, uh, on the other side, right? There is a bird street, there, bird market, yeah, exactly. And that's uh, one of my favorite. I always like to go there. I, it always makes me both sad to see the birds in the cage, but also delighted to see them, to hear them sing and to see the color and everything. So, all right, so I'm going to talk to you about um, .NET Standard, .NET Core. And so this is a, a, a talk um, that I've been presenting already a few times, but it's always required again and again. And I think it's a good thing because there is um, some misunderstanding around .NET Standard, .NET Core. Are they the same? Are they different? Why should we use them? Uh, what good are they? And so I'm going to try to clarify that a little bit. Um, this slide is actually old because our team has grown so much that I don't have enough space now to put everyone. Um, I need to find a better way to represent that. But what's really important here is that you can actually follow us on Twitter. So we have a list which is pretty up to date with all the cloud developer advocates, or I should say cloud advocates, uh, because now we also have operations people. So if you are more into ops than dev, into the DevOps team, right? We have devs and ops. We have also an, an ops team now. So we have cloud operation advocates. And um, so everybody can be followed here. And of course, the hashtags where you can find us. We also have a Twitter account. All right, so without further ado, so sharing code through, uh, through the ages, where did we start? So we started early on with .NET. I don't know if you remember, I came to .NET from Java. And the reason why I came to .NET is because uh, I was working for Siemens at the time in 2001. And Siemens was a very, very heavy C++ programmer firm, right? Um, nowadays, they do .NET a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, Siemens is the biggest .NET developer worldwide in terms of number of developers. Um, but in the beginning, you know, it was C++ really a lot. And since I was a Java guy, they told me it's almost the same. You just need to change the letters, the capitals, right? And then it's, you know, it's pretty much the same. So they asked me to do a, um, to do a prototype, and I, I started like that in, uh, in .NET in 2001. And so in the beginning, we had only two client frameworks. We had for the web ASP.NET 1.0, and then we had for the desktop Windows Forms, okay? And uh, of course, you didn't need to share across platforms, because even if you wanted to share a library between the web ASP.NET and WinForms, it was the same runtime anyway, right? It was .NET. So you didn't have any issues no, no need to share code, really. But then later came Civilite. That's when we raised our Woo! fist, right? Yeah. yeah. Huh? Civilite. So Civilite was awesome. I think we all agree. Um, and basically, it was, uh, however, causing a few issues in terms of cross-platform compatibility because it was another implementation of .NET. So when I talk about implementations of .NET, .NET is a specification. All right. So you have it's like ECMAScript if you want. You can have in theory and in fact in practice as well multiple implementations of .NET, and they tell you, okay, if you want to be a .NET framework, you need to fulfill those. Uh, requirements, okay? And so already at the time, we had actually two implementations of .NET. We had the .NET framework, you know, published by Microsoft running on Windows. And then we had Mono, which was an open source implementation of .NET, which later, you know, through a lot of hoops, uh, led to Xamarin. And so when Civilite came out from uh, Microsoft, um, us developers, we had to suddenly create applications with a different version of .NET. And so maybe we had uh, an application which was developed in WPF, like a full-blown application, client application with a lot of features, et cetera. And then somebody, marketing, would ask us, can you do a companion application that is going to be lightweight with less features, but similar features, and that we can distribute over the web so that it can run easily and that it can also run possibly on, uh, on Macintosh, right? So that was the idea. So you have less APIs than in a full .NET, 
But on the plus side, of course, Silverlight was compatible with, for example, Mac OS. Uh, later, there was also an implementation uh, for Linux called Moonlight, uh, and also portability. So it was, uh, it was quite a nice, uh, nice feature to have. So how did we do things back then when we wanted to share code? What we would do is what I would call develop preventively, meaning that every time that we wanted to use in a, in a class library to use an API, we would check, okay, is this API also available on Silverlight? If I take an example, maybe HTTP client, for example, in the beginning was only in the full .NET. You didn't have it in, uh, in Silverlight. So you had to use HTTP web requests instead. Okay, which was more complicated to use, so it was annoying. Then later, in the later version of Silverlight, HTTP client came, and so we could use also HTTP client. And then we would share the files between the Silverlight application and the WPF application using a feature called Add as a Link, which I'm going to demonstrate later. It's still available in Visual Studio. And then you would build twice, so you would build one for the WPF applications, one for the Silverlight application. And then if you had errors, sometimes you had to go in the code and fix them, sometimes with precompiler directives, which is always annoying because it's it makes the code a little bit dirty, right? Uh, but that was a way, and so basically we were trying to have one version of the, of the code files and then build twice. So that was the idea. So now, uh, still, like I said, in Visual Studio, you can add as a link. So when you add an item, you would go and click on the small arrow here, and then it uh, expands a, a combo box, and then you add as a link. What it does is that it's add, it adds a shortcut in the, in the project files but it doesn't add a copy of the file physically on the drive. I'll show that to you a little bit later. So then in 2011 came Portable Class Libraries, PCL, okay? And that was a big deal at the time because it was the first time that we had binary compatible assemblies. So instead of sharing at the code file level and building twice, you could build a project, a class library, add your files into that, build once, and then you would say, okay, I want to target WPF, so the full .NET, and Silverlight, and later came uh, Xamarin, and later came uh, Windows 10, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Windows Phone, you forgot Windows Phone. I forgot Windows Phone, and who didn't, right? Forget Windows Phone. So you would select a profile for the compatibility, and those profiles were really very bad. Um, it was horrible to remember, and if you think about it, there are a lot of profiles, because let's say that you have three platforms. Well, you have three factorial profiles, right? Because you have all three, then you have two, then you have the other two, and then you have one, 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 right? So it's three, bang, right? Three factorial. So then if you have four, suddenly it's a lot more. And then if you have five different platforms, it's a lot, lot, lot more. So we had really a lot of profiles, and all those profiles had numbers, I remember. And I could never remember what is profile 57 or 68, and I felt like a failure as a developer because I couldn't remember that. And then one day, somebody at Microsoft on the .NET team told me, oh, we don't remember either. So I knew that it was not too bad eventually, but it was very, very annoying. So those profiles were not great. So the result that you get when you create a portable class library, if you say, I want WPF and Silverlight, you will have basically the intersection of the platform, you will have the APIs which are available on both platforms, okay? And then if you add Xamarin, for example, you will have the intersection of the three platforms, only the APIs which are available on all three platforms. So it is the least common denominator approach, okay? Now that sounds like a good idea. In fact, it worked pretty well until, I would say, 2016, 17, when .NET standards started really coming out strong. But it has a few issues. You can still now create class libraries, portable class libraries in Visual Studio, but it's a little bit hidden. You have to search in the search box. They don't surface the templates in the categories anymore. And they mark them as legacy, which should tell you, well, yeah, which should tell you that uh, you shouldn't use it anymore. That's kind of the idea. So the idea now is to move away from, uh, from portable class libraries and into .NET standard. So if I summarize what I just said, if you select, this is what you see when you create a portable class library, you can select your platforms. And uh, here, if you select the full-blown .NET, it doesn't make sense to create a portable class library. In fact, it tells you that it doesn't make sense because if you create a portable class library which has everything, you might as well create a non-portable class library. Okay, but then, of course, if you add another checkbox, then it starts making sense, and yet another, and then you have the intersection of those three platforms that you can use. Okay, so I'm going to show you a quick demo 
about this. And to do that, I'm going to go into Visual Studio. And so I prepared two projects, two solutions, I should say. Here I have one with a Universal Windows application for Windows 10. And here I have a WPF one, OK? And those two applications do exactly the same. They are basically showing you a text box. You can enter your name. There is a button. It sends a request to an Azure function. It's a serverless API, if you want. I'm not going into the details here, but basically it's just something running on Azure. And so it has exactly the same feature. So it means that I can share some code. So to do that, I'm going to go into my Windows version here. I'm going to add a folder. Let's call that model, for example. I'm going to add a new, in fact, here I'm adding an existing item because I already prepared a file. Normally, I would add a new item. And so if I go and take this uh, view model here, so here I'm adding it physically to my project. So it means that if I go into source control, I have a new file that I need to, to check in, to commit. But then if I want to add the same file into my WPF application, I'm going to also add a new folder. And then I can go and right click, add existing item. And then this time, I'm going to go into my Windows 10 application, into model, take this file. And instead of adding it with add, I add it as a link. OK? And so what it does is that you see now I have this small arrow, which is barely visible here, which says it's not a real file, it's a shortcut. OK, so it has been added in the csproj file, but it's not available physically. If I open this folder in File Explorer, you see that it's empty. OK, so I have only one version of the file. Now, this um, technique is still absolutely useful. For example, if you want to share, uh, let's say you have uh, like a Xamarin application with Android, iOS, and Windows. For example, you want to share some pictures between those three apps, but you want the picture to be only once in your source control. For example, that's how you can do it. Or if you want to share, uh, I don't know, some, some assets between a, a web app and a Windows app, for example, you could do that as well. So now, of course, if I build this, uh, it's just going to run. Famous last words, right? <laughs> but normally, it should build. And then I can run uh, my WPF application and my Windows 10 app in a moment. <clears throat> All right, it's taking a moment because it's restoring some packages, which is always a joy. All right, I think it's finally going to run. No. Yes, yes, finally, OK, build completed. So now this is a WPF application. I'm going to set the other one as start project as well. Like this, it can start. UWP is always a little bit slower to start. It's, you know, I'm just heckling uh, Matt, who worked for Windows before. <laughs> you don't care anymore, exactly. Everything's in the cloud now. So basically, I have my two applications. And if I enter my name here and say, Please wait, and then it will say, should say hello from Hong Kong. Here we go. And I have exactly the same functionality here. So now the nice thing with this uh, way of doing things is that if I go into this file and add some functionality, I need to add the functionality only once, and it will be automatically available in WPF as well. In fact, there is a cool feature here. I don't know if you know this combo box here, but it tells you what is the context in which this file is compiled? OK? And that's really useful because, for example, if here I am into the, um, the UWP version of the application, I can say using Windows, for example. But using Windows doesn't make any sense in WPF because this is a, a framework that doesn't exist here. So after a while, you see that now I have an error appearing because now it's trying to recompile in the context of WPF. So it's telling me where the error comes from. If I build now, we'll have an error, but I don't necessarily see it immediately. It depends on the context of the file. Now I can see it much better. So that's pretty good. OK, so that would be the shared files option. So that's how we would do things in the beginning. And then came the portable class library. So with portable class libraries, it's a little bit cleaner, I would say. So here I have the same application three times, once for Android, UWP, and WPF. So now what I can do is add a fourth project. 
And this time I'm going to select a portable class library. So like I told you, if you go inside here, you won't find it. You need to search for it. Portable, here we go. They are marked as legacy, okay. There is even a Visual Basic one, which is <laughs> probably even more legacy. I'm, I'm not saying anything here. Um, and then I'm going to call that portable.data, for example. And so now comes the step where I need to select which platform is it going to run on. So I want WPF, so this is .NET Framework full. I want Windows 10 and I want Android. Uh, I want Xamarin Android. Um, here, if I select Xamarin Android, it's going to automatically select Xamarin iOS as well because it's the same profile. And in fact, it tells you that here below. It doesn't really matter in our case. And so everything I'm showing you now, you need to forget because you shouldn't use that anymore, but it's just interesting to see it once. So now if I remove this class and add my main view model just like before, I'm going to take it from my repo again. It's down there. Here we go. And so now, of course, I need to what we call scaffold my application. I need to wire things together. So I will need one reference in my Android application to my data, to my portable class library. OK, so if I go on the project, it's here. And then I need the same thing in my universal Windows platform application. So it's a little bit annoying to have to do that. But the good thing is that you do that only once. And then if you want to add new files into your data library, it's automatically going to be available everywhere. So you need to do the scaffolding only once, and then you're good to go. All right? I'm not going to run it because it's exactly the same as before, but basically you see the trick. So the difference with before is that every time I wanted to add a new file in the shared file situation, I need to reshare it to add the shortcut everywhere, which is really kind of annoying and a little bit of a maintenance nightmare. OK, so those were our two options before .NET Standard. And so what did the team do? What did the team decide? So what happened is that at some point, um, the .NET team came together and said, well, there is a little bit of a problem with PCL, with portable class libraries. This least common denominator approach is really annoying. And one thing which is really annoying is that when you try to add new platforms, you risk breaking your project. So think about it. If you have, let's say you have a WPF and a UWP portable class library, everything goes well. And then suddenly your boss comes and says, hey, we need to support Android and iOS now. So you say, no problem, I can add Xamarin. But then maybe suddenly your portable class library doesn't build anymore because it's a least common denominator approach. Suddenly you have less APIs at your disposal. Okay? So that's not really a great approach if you want to maintain and evolve your libraries. Okay? So the .NET team said, okay, we need to rethink the whole thing. And so they came up with an idea. They said, let's implement a new version of .NET, which we will call .NET Core. And in the beginning, in version 1.0, they selected only a small subset of APIs that they wanted to implement. Just what was needed to run some simple websites, okay? And maybe some, actually I have that here, and maybe some, uh, some console applications that you could run as utility, for example, on servers, etc. So it was more meant, it was in fact a project of the ASP.NET team. It was more meant as a, as a web thing, okay, at first. But they started already from the start with the idea of making it compatible for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So that was pretty cool because you had an application that you could build, and then suddenly you could run this application, in that case an, a web server, in Linux as well without any changes. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So then later came, of course, the same issue as before. How do we know which APIs are going to be available? Because now we have the full .NET, we have UWP, and then in addition, we have also .NET Core. And so they had the idea of saying, let's not go into the profiles anymore. What we are going to do now is a clear specification. We are going to call that .NET Standard. And we are going to say, OK, if your application, if your framework supports .NET Standard 1.0, those are the APIs that it has to support. If it supports .NET standards 1.1, those are the APIs that it has to support. And the cool thing is that it's always backwards compatible. So if you have .NET standard 1.1, it's going to have everything from .NET, 1 .0, .NET standard 1.0 plus a few additional things. OK, 1.2 is everything from 1.0 and 1.1 plus a few things. So it's always backwards compatible. Like this, you know exactly what you're expecting. 
And then after that, they started saying, okay, how do we, um, how do we actually implement that? Okay, so we have .NET Core, it's one thing. But then later, Xamarin, for example, also do, supports the .NET standard and um, other, um, so ASP.NET Core, well, ASP.NET Core is .NET Core technically, but now with uh, .NET Core 3.0, which is going to come out at some point, even WPF and Windows Forms are going to support .NET Standard as well. Okay, so basically we are at a point now where pretty much everything supports .NET Standard. And if we look at the platforms today, already today, every one of our platforms can uh, support a .NET Standard class library. Okay, so if you have a .NET Standard class library, I'm going to show you later how we implement that. You can use it in .NET Framework, so in ASP.NET, the full ASP.NET, or WPF, in Windows UWP, in ASP.NET Core, in Xamarin. So basically, if you put what you had before into your portable class library, if you put it in a .NET Standard class library, you can be used by everything. Okay, good. So now let's talk about the APIs a little bit and the versions because it's quite important to understand that. So I told you that in the beginning they started with .NET Core 1.0, which was an implementation of .NET Standard 1.0, and they supported only a small subset of APIs. But the good thing is that it was compatible with pretty much everything we had, including Windows Phone 8.0. I'm not even talking about Windows Phone 10, right? I'm saying, or Mobile 10. I'm saying Windows Phone 8.0 or Windows 8.0, which I think literally nobody uses anymore. <laughs> at, least I, at least I hope. So, so that's cool. So when you create a class library, you need to select like a .NET standard class library, you need to select a version, okay? So maybe you start with .NET standard 1.0 and then you say, oh, dang, I want to use an API which is not available there. So maybe I need to upgrade, for example, to .NET Standard 1.6. So now I have more APIs, quite a lot more. But suddenly, your old application, which is targeting Windows 8.0, is not going to support that anymore. You cannot add this as a reference. It doesn't work, OK? Or if you have .NET Framework, you need to upgrade your .NET Framework to 461. And that can be a real issue, because in the enterprise, you know that upgrading .NET Framework is a, is a big deal, because you need to upgrade the whole PC and maybe the whole fleet of PCs, right? So that's that difficult. And even further, if you go to 2.0, now you have really a lot of APIs, like they talk about 20,000 new APIs. Now we have 2.2 even, so it's a little bit better. Uh, 3.0 is going to come at some point. Um, but we have even more restrictions, like for example, for uh, UWP, you need to go to 16.299 at least, or if you go to .NET Core, you need to upgrade to .NET Core 2.0, okay? So basically what I'm telling you is summarized in this table. It looks like a horrible table, but I'm going to explain that to you. And in fact, it's a small subset of an, of an even bigger table which is available at this URL. What this table tells you is that if you develop an application, try to go as high as you go, as you can. Like for example, if you develop a WPF application, if you can try to take the latest version, I think the latest is actually 4.6.2 now, or maybe even higher. Yes, maybe even 4.7, right? So try to go as high as you go, because then you can add a .NET standard class library implemented with any one of those versions, because those versions are always backwards compatible. So if you have a .NET standard class library which has been implemented with 1.0, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, etc. It's going to work into your application. You can reference it, okay? Now, on the other hand, if you develop a class library with .NET Standard, you should always target the lowest possible version, okay? Because like this, every framework is going to be able to reference it. So when you start with a new .NET Standard class library, start with 1.0, then you try things out. And then it suddenly, if suddenly it tells you, oh, there is an API that you're trying to use, which doesn't work, which doesn't exist in 1.0, but it does exist in 1.4, then okay, maybe you have to upgrade to 1.4, but then you need to remember that I'm going to lose .NET Framework 4.5. I need to go to 4.61 for that, okay? So try to start as low as possible and then increment as needed or find workarounds. Okay, if HTTP client is not available, maybe you have to use HTTP web request instead. Okay, cool. So why do we even bother? 
Okay, why do we go through all this pain? Well, the good thing is that once we have a .NET Core application, it is cross-platform and amongst other things, it's running on Linux. So I'm going to show you a video. And the reason why I did a video here and I'm not showing you live is that in this video, there is a lot of waiting because I'm creating something and I'm publishing it to Azure. And the whole demo would take about 15 minutes, but most of it is waiting. So by the magic of editing, I reduce it to five minutes. So I'm going to show you what happens. So, oh yeah, another thing I want to tell you is that here I'm using the command line to do that because I'm a hipster. Actually, I'm not, I prefer UI. So I go usually in Visual Studio to do things. But I hear that it's very hip these days to do everything in command line. So I just want to show you that we have a lot of tools, okay? So you can do things actually in uh, the command line if you want. You can do things in Visual Studio code if you want that runs on Linux as well, for example, or on Mac or on Windows, of course. Or you can go like me, I prefer rather the full-blown Visual Studio. It's a matter of, of choice, really. So here inside the command line, I'm going to create a new, oops, no, that's a bunny. <laughs> I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to change to this folder. And then I'm going to select .NET new Razor. So what does it do? It creates a new ASP.NET application using the Razor template. And the Razor template is just a simple template. So now I'm running this locally at localhost 5000. And that is the template, I guess. So it's a very simple very simple template, but now if I, if I go into it, I see that I can edit it and modify it as I want. So right now it's running locally. Okay. So now I stop it and then I do git init, which means that I'm going to add the files into git. Okay, I'm going to initialize the git folder. I'm going to commit the files. And then I go into the portal. And I don't know if you know this here, but into the portal we have uh, a cloud shell. So the cloud shell is basically a way to interact with your resources using a command line interaction. Okay? You can do that if you're on a Mac, you can do that from Bash or in Linux. If you're on uh, Windows, you can do it from PowerShell, from the command line if you, have, if you prefer command, or from uh, the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, which is also running Bash on Windows. Or if you don't have all that, no problem, you just go into the web browser, you open a, uh, a cloud shell, like we call it, and then you can start interacting with your thing. So in that case, I'm going to use AZ, which is the Azure command line interaction. So here I'm going to create a new resource group with the name LB test Linux. And then I'm saying, okay, the location should be Western Europe because that's closest to my users. And then once this is done, I'm going to create a new app service plan. So basically I'm defining what resources my website is going to have, like how much RAM, how much uh, you know, uh, storage, etc., etc. And then I'm saying, okay, this is the name of the plan and I'm going to add it to my resource group. So basically it says how I'm going to be built. The SKU is S1, which is the smallest billable that we have. And I say is Linux. So now I say my app service plan is already going to specify that my applications running there are going to run on Linux. Then I create the web application itself, the website, which is the web server, if you want, which is going to run on that. So I say, okay, this is the plan I want to use. This is the name of the, um, of the web app. And the runtime is going to be .NET Core 2.0. So like I told you, right, at that time when I showed the video, the 2.0 was the highest. I go as high as possible for the application. And I say the deployment is going to be local from Git. So at that point, I should explain to you that when you want to deploy an application to Azure, you have multiple ways to do this, okay? You can do it, the best way to do it is with a DevOps pipeline. So basically you set up something, for example, in uh, Azure DevOps where you say, okay, I do a pipeline where every time that somebody builds um, or every time somebody commits, I'm going to automatically build, run my tests. If the tests are successful, I can automatically deploy to staging or maybe to testing first, then staging, then production, etc. Here in that case, I'm choosing a pipeline which is a little bit simpler, I would say. It means that every time I'm committing to my repo, it's going to automatically push to production. Very bad, uh, I should push to staging, but it's just to demo. And yet, and then you have also other ways to do that. For example, in Visual Studio, you can also publish, which is probably not a great idea in production, but it works as well. Okay, so now this is the 
URL of my remote repository. I'm not on GitHub, I'm in two uh, VSTS, okay, in, in two Azure DevOps. So now inside Git, I say I add this, uh, re this remote, and then I'm going to push. Of course, the first time I need to um, enter my credentials, okay? And then this part is taking a while, so this is why I speed everything up in the edit. But basically, I'm pushing everything to Git, and because I specified that into my uh, web app, it's going to automatically push it to production as well, and then I will be ready to run. All right, so this is the first push, so of course everything needs to be updated. Now I'm done, so now I can go and copy the remote URL of my new website. And if I paste it here, you see that it was running. So now I'm going back to Windows, I open Visual Studio Code, and you see this is what was created when I did .NET New Razor. So for example, I can go and edit this part. And now the nice thing with this way of doing things is that now I'm on Windows, right? I could run it on Windows to test it on Windows. But now if I push to Git, to Azure, it's going to publish it. And now I know that in Azure it's running on, on uh, Linux. I test on Windows, I push on Linux, and then it just runs because of the magic of ASP.NET Core. So basically, if I go into the About page, we see that my change was published, OK? So of course, this is great, because why Linux? Huh? Most of the web runs on Linux, OK? It's cheaper. It's quite reliable. Not saying that Windows servers are not reliable, but you know, it's probably even more reliable. And also, a lot of, um, of uh, website administrators know Linux very well. And so if you want to hire a new person, chances are that they know Linux pretty well. So like this, you give them the choice. Basically, you say, oh, I have an app. It's uh, .NET Core. If you make me a case, I'll push it from Windows to Linux, and we're OK with that. And it's good for us on Azure anyway, because we have Linux as an offering. So we're happy to welcome everybody. OK, so that would be the, the reason. So now let's talk about portable class libraries versus .NET standard. And to do that, I decided to show you a real life example. So for those of you who don't know, I am the creator of a popular um, toolkit called MVVM Lite. And it's quite popular since 2009, where I published it. I had something like 3,500,000 downloads. So it's used quite widely, I would say. And it's used to build applications in WPF, in Windows 10, back then in Silverlight, of course, and uh, also in uh, Xamarin. So the architecture of the project was like that. So what happens here is that when I created the project in 2009, I created it only for WPF at the time. And then very fast, I decided to add Silverlight to the mix. So I did that when Silverlight 2 came out. And um, it meant that I had two projects. I had one project for WPF, one project for Silverlight. And then later, Xamarin came out, and I decided to support that as well. And so I had three projects. And then Windows 10 came out, and I had four. Okay, so it started to grow in a bad manner. It was very annoying to maintain. And at some point, I was lucky that the, um, the team uh, who created the portable class library, who was the, um, ah, what are they called now? The people who did PRISM. Uh, patents and practices, voila, PNP, exactly. So the patents and practices team, which are at the origin of uh, Portable Class Library, reached out to me and asked me if I, if I agreed for them to take MVVM Lite and to put it, to, cre to, to convert it into a Portable Class Library. And the reason why they wanted to do that is because they wanted to take a, a framework which was already widely used, but which was not overly complex and try to put it as a PCL. And like this, it would learn from the experience, seeing what doesn't work and you know, what do we need to do better. So I was really happy uh, to hear them propose that, because it's free labor. So I'm <laughs> always for that, right? And uh, plus, they knew what they were doing. I didn't. So that was really good. And so um, my, my good friend, Oren Novotny, is actually the guy who did most of the work. This guy is a genius, if you don't know him. Um, he's also an MVP, and uh, he did most of the port. He had, if you go and check the, uh, the source code on GitHub, you will see that there are a few places I can show you if you're interested. There are a few places where he had to do a few workarounds to make it work. But basically, uh, he managed to put everything into a portable class library, which is pretty cool. 
So I have the following arch architecture as a PCL. I have uh, what I call the core components, which are in two uh, DLL called Galasoft MVVM Lite. And then I have, at the time, I decided to support a new ID from Pattern Set Practices, which is called Common Service Locator. So that sounds like a great ID. Uh, it was like uh, Kumbaya, everybody's friend, huh? where basically they say, OK, back then, a lot of people were releasing something called IOC containers. So who doesn't know what an IOC container is? Don't be shy. I'm going to explain to it if you. Everybody knows. You're sure? Kind of. OK. Yeah, somebody. OK, good. Courageous person. Um, so IOC container, basically, there is a pattern called dependency injection, OK, where you say, OK, in, in short, IOC container is a little bit like a big cache. OK, so into your application, you have a global cache where you're going to save some, uh, some classes, some instances. Like, for example, let's say that I want to have, um, I don't know, I want to have a client for, uh, for an API. OK, let's call it data service, for example. So I can have an implementation of my data service into my cache, into my IOC container. And then from everywhere in the application, I can say get instance from my cache, and then I can use it. So why do I want to do that? It's because the nice thing with IOC containers, I can also abstract the client. I can say, instead of, get, of saying get instance of data service, I say get instance of I data service. And then when my application starts, I'm going to register. I'm going to say every time that somebody asks for an I data service, please give them a data service. But then I can have also another implementation, for example, for unit test, I can have Another implementation, which I call test data service, which also implements iData service. And then I say, every time that somebody requires an iData service, give them a test data service, not the data service from production, but the test. Okay? Now, for the consumer of the iData service, he doesn't know, and he doesn't have to know. That's the beauty of it. Okay? You are just going to call whatever method is defined by the interface, by the iData service interface, but you don't need to know what the implementation is actually going to do. That can be very useful. For example, if you have cross-platform applications, it's a great example. Let's imagine that you have uh, a plugin which takes a picture. Okay, Taking a picture on an Android device is not the same at all as taking a picture on an iOS device. The APIs are completely different. So in Xamarin, what we do is that we do a uh, media plugin, we call it. And then this media plugin is going to have an implementation on Android which takes a picture in the Android way, an implementation on iOS which takes a picture in the iOS way, and then it has an interface, a definition which has a method saying take picture with a few uh, common parameters. Okay? And then after that, when you take the picture in your Xamarin application, you don't know if you're on Android or on iOS and you don't care. Okay? You just take the picture and that's it. So the uh, IOC container is very useful for these kind of scenarios. Or also, if you have things like unit test, uh, for example, in unit test, we try to avoid calling actual websites. Because if you want to test, uh, I don't know, you want to test an error, and then you have to call Google to say, can you please shut down your website for a moment? Just because I want to try things out and you know, create an error, it doesn't work, right? So in that case, you create a test client, and you raise an error. OK, so <clears throat> long story short, everybody at the time was creating their own IOC containers. So you have multiple IOC containers on the market. When you do .NET, you have uh, one in MVVM Lite called Simple IOC. But you also had one in, uh, I don't know, one called uh, Autofac, or there is Unity, not the Unity 3D, another Unity. Uh, Prism has one, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a number. So Patents and Practices said, hey, we have a good idea. Everybody's friend. If we decide to switch an IOC container with another one, it would be cool if they all implement the same interface like this. And the changes into my application are going to be minimal. Okay? So we are all going to implement the so-called iService Locator, which is contained into a library called Common Service Locator. And like this, everybody's, everybody's happy. Sounded like a great idea. I said, OK, my simple IOC, my IOC container, is going to implement that as well. And that was really uh, not a very good idea, I would say. It's still causing me headaches these days, mostly because it's a dependency on a third party component that I don't own. Okay? This is developed by another project altogether, uh, by, uh, by another team altogether. So that's the first thing. Also, the other thing is that it's really solving a problem 
it's a great solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Uh, that's what I call it. Because, in fact, how many times in the lifetime of an application are you going to swap IOC container? Probably zero, OK? Because you all have an IOC container that you prefer. So you're going to use it. And maybe once, OK? But for, for just one time, this whole effort is not worth it. So I was not super happy with uh, Common Service Locator, but basically that's what I had. And so in addition to those libraries, I also have some platform libraries. So I have some components which are only available on Android. I have some components only on iOS, for example, the data binding system. In Windows, I don't need it because there is one already. But in iOS and Android, I implemented one. Uh, I have some components for .NET 4.5, etc. So that's the library I have and the, the landscape I had before I ported to .NET standard. So now comes the time of refactoring, which is a great time because you can fix errors that you made. And the first error I wanted to fix is get rid of common service locator. OK? Uh, no kumbaya anymore. <laughs> and uh, like I said, multiple reasons. First reason, it's really a dependency on a project I don't own. It's really annoying because every time they upgrade the version of here, it breaks my stuff. So it's really causing me issues. They took it down. They, no, it still exists. But it's somebody else who uploaded another version. Because yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? And, and now I have another issues. Another third party now. And now I have issues with that as well. And so I'm probably going to release a new version of, uh, of the portable class library without that at all. Anyway, cool. So I wanted to remove that from the .NET standard version. Now, that would be a breaking change. But I'm OK with it because I would say the port from PCL to .NET standard is a step which is big enough that I can introduce breaking changes if I document them enough, OK? So now if I remove common service locator, I don't need those two DLLs anymore. Why did I have two DLLs? I didn't tell you the story. This is also very complicated. When you have a project which is widely used, you encounter all kinds of weird requests. Like, for example, once I had a call from a firm who asked me to fill paperwork so that their developers could use my open source project. I said no. Well, I didn't say no. I said yes, but for 500 bucks an hour. <laughs> and then they said, yeah, but your project is free. I said yes, but my time is not, right? <laughs> so OK. So I didn't do that. But basically, procurement is hating when you have more than one DLL into a project, because um, every time they have to fill, and Siemens was like that, right? Every time you have to fill some paperwork for every component that you pull. And so if I go back here, here I had uh, one here which is Galasoft, OK, that they could talk to. But then I had another one which I didn't control, which was in addition. So I did. I separated this DLL like this. If they decided not to use that, they could still use this, but they didn't have to use that. Does that make sense? OK. So now, since I removed the common service locator, I don't need that anymore. So I can have only one DLL. So it's way easier for me as well. And then, of course, there was a problem of the platform DLLs because they had the reference on the portable class library. So I need to change that. So I have another set of those platforms, which this time is called standard. And basically, that's my new landscape, which is a lot easier. OK? Cool. So now what I will do in front of you is show you how, how I ported from my portable class library version into my .NET standard version. And you will see that it takes literally just a few minutes. So this is the MVVM Lite project on GitHub. That's exactly what I have on GitHub, right? So now, this is already supporting .NET standard. But if I go back in time approximately two years ago, or three years now, my god, time flies, this is the last version before I ported to .NET standard. So I'm going to go and check this out, which means that basically I'm going back in time three years ago, OK? So now I have a version of the application, which uh, a version of the class library, I would say, which here, you see that it still says VS 2015, because back then that's what we had. OK, we didn't have 17 yet. I'm going to open it in 17 anyway, because I don't have 15 installed, which means that I will have a, I'm recorded, so I will have a, a lot of errors. I was going to say <laughs> to say something else. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'm just going to say, OK, a lot of uh, libraries which are inside there are not supported. For example, I still have the Civilite 5 versions into there. This is, of course, I know, right? This is not supported anymore. No problem. This is just telling me the report. So now you see the architecture that I showed you before. So I have my test. 
I have something for .NET 3.5, which of course is not available here. Now this is a portable class library that I mentioned. So this one is going to support .NET 4.5, it's supporting Xamarin, it's supporting uh, UWP, uh, um, etc. And here I have the, the other one, which is called the Extras, and the Extra has only the IOC container that I mentioned before. And here I have the reference to Microsoft the practices the service location, <laughs> that the common service locator that I mentioned before. OK. Good. So now I'm going to convert that. And those are the platforms libraries. You see that I have a few. For each platform, I have some components which are platform specific. All right. So now let's create a new portable class library. Well, actually, a new .NET standard library. So I'm going to go to new project. And now here into .NET standard, OK, so don't confuse .NET Core. .NET Core is a reminder that the application and .NET Standard is a class library. Now, to make things easier, clever people at Microsoft decided that you would have also a .NET Core class library. Don't use it. <laughs> uh, let's say it's simple. Don't use it. It's a bad idea. OK, so we will use now a class library .NET Standard. Now, I'm going to create that. Let's call it galasoft.mvvmlite.std for standard, for example. I'm going to create that. And now the very first thing I'm going to do when Visual Studio creates a new class library, it's going to try to default it to the highest possible version of the framework. But I told you it's bad, right? We want to go low. We want to start with 1.0. So let's do that. I'm going to change that into the properties of my project. And here, I'm going to go to 1.0, OK? I'm going to try. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, I'll go to 1.1. Good, so now this is done. Let's remove this class. And so now what I'm going to do is basically take all my classes from my PCL, from my portable class library, and dump them into my .NET standard. And I'm going to try to build, because what, uh, what could happen, really? So I'm going to take everything that has class files. Now here, I'm going to copy them. In reality, I would add them as a link because I don't want to have two versions of the files. But that takes longer. So here, I'm just going to copy them here. And now that this is done, I'm going to build. It's going to take a moment. And unsurprisingly, I'm going to have some errors because there are a few things which don't work. That's normal. So let's wait and see what's happening. And I can already tell you the first error I will have is because I'm using somewhere an API which, doesn't, which exists only in WPF, which doesn't exist anywhere else. So this is going to cause me an issue. And you see, that's what it says here. It says, the type of namespace name message box result could not be found. So that is correct. It doesn't exist, except in WPF. And in fact, I knew that. And I already told my users long ago that this class is obsolete now. You shouldn't use it anymore. So now that I'm into .NET Center, it's really a good time to just remove it. So I'm simply going to remove that class. It doesn't exist anymore. OK? People have been warned. Now I have other errors. The next one is the type of namespace threading doesn't exist. That's weird because I'm, I know for a fact that threading is there. So what's happening here? The problem is that the clever people at Windows decided to change namespaces. Ooh, ah oh, no, you're not in Windows anymore. <laughs> so when they created UWP, they said, hey, instead of having system.windows.threading, we are going to have windows.ui.xaml because it's almost the same, right? No, I think that's the core, right? Threading is in the core, probably. So in a sense, in .NET standard, they decided to follow the conventions of the Windows 10 version of .NET. And so if you want system windows of threading, it's actually into Windows UI core. So basically what it says, you see I was already prepared here. I said, if NetFX core, if I'm using Windows 10, you should rather add those two. If not, if I'm on WPF, you should add those, OK? So here I'm going to tell my .NET standard project that it should follow the convention set for Windows 10. OK? Now if I build, we will have another one of those errors. And this error comes also from some namespace definition, 
just takes a second to rebuild. Uh, all right, and so the last one is this Windows here, which is not available. And because not only I have to follow the, the NetFX core definition, but I also have to follow the portable class library definition. So basically, there are some namespaces which, are, which have different names, which is a little bit annoying. Once this is done, basically my code builds. So you see that it was not that big a deal, OK? So now I have all the core components have been ported to .NET standard. That's cool. But I still have the IOC container, remember? So why don't we do that? So now I'm going to go to the extras. I'm going to take here this folder, copy it there. Now I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to rebuild that. And like you would expect, it's going to fail again. Is it rebuilding? It's not rebuilding. Why not rebuild? Oh, it already failed. Um, it failed because Microsoft the practices that service location cannot be found. That's correct. That's a common service locator that I didn't add. So I'm going to remove it, which means that I cannot use this interface anymore. That's the Kumbaya interface. <laughs> the one that if you implement, everybody can swap your IOC container and be happy. Here in that case, I say, no, I hate happiness. Let's remove it, OK? And now I still have one other here. And what I did here is that I decided to use this activation exception, which comes from the common service locator library. And so here I need to replace it with something else. I decided to replace it with invalid operation exception. Now, this is a breaking change, right? If you have somebody who, uh, who catches uh, activation exception, their code is going to fail. But then they go to mbvmlight.net, they find the documentation, and they know why, and no problem, OK? So I just need to replace it. I have a few of those. OK, and now I can build, and now it's going to run. So why did I do that again? Right. Well, now, first of all, I have a .NET standard version of MVVM Lite, which is good, because some people were already building some applications with .NET standard class library, and then suddenly they have to add a PCL library, and then there was some compatibility issues. So now they have everything on .NET standard way better. Another cool thing is that now, if you create a new, if you create a new Xamarin Forms project, for example. So if you go to cross-platform, mobile app, create a Xamarin Forms application, you see the .NET sharing strategy now. They don't use PCL anymore. They use .NET standard. So that would be the project in which you put your UI and your shared code in Xamarin, which then later runs on iOS, Android, and Windows. So when you use Xamarin, you want to have everything in .NET standard if possible. It makes life really easier. But also, it means that now you can use MVVM Lite on Linux as well. And in fact, why don't we do that? So I'm going to go and create a new. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you made this .NET standard library now. Mm -hmm. uh, but for example, the threading example you use, no, no, it needs to be the Windows 10 version of threading, yeah. not the WPF version of threading. Yeah. So how would this work in a WPF app? So it works because basically .NET standard translates the call, right? Type so, forwarding. sorry? Type Types forwarding. forwarding, exactly. So basically what it means is that it knows that when you call, in that case, the system the threading is there for the task class, okay? Which is super important when you do async and await. So every time that you use the task class in WPF, .NET standard is going to translate the call, to forward the call to the system.windows.threading library, which is running underneath. And so that's uh, basically the beauty of it is that it is abstracting the differences between the platforms. But you said that .NET was the interface and .NET Core was an implementation of .NET Standard. So this is done in the .NET framework? So not exactly. So here we have to differentiate between applications and libraries, OK, class libraries. So when you do an application, and you have and your application support, which WPF doesn't yet, by the way, right? It will with .NET Core 3.0, but it doesn't yet support .NET Standard. It, it doesn't implement .NET Standard yet, right? Oh, that's yeah. But you can use .NET Standard class libraries already. That works. 
okay, because of the type forwarding thing. So what it means is that if I have a WPF application and I have a, a .NET standard class library like MVVM Lite, I can use it, okay. What it doesn't yet, it's not an implementation of .NET Core 1.0 now of .NET Standard 3.0. Uh, sorry, why is that important? So, I, I do just a quick uh, side here. So you may have heard that WPF and Windows Forms are going to support .NET Core 3.0. What does it mean? Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that magically you can develop a WPF application and run it, run it on Linux. Okay, it doesn't mean that. And the reason why it doesn't mean that is that there is no UI stack currently which runs both on Linux and on Windows. So the UI is the issue here, okay? So it was not really developed in terms of cross-platform compatibility, but it has a really nice feature, however. It is that .NET Core versions can run side by side on Windows. So if you have a WPF application and you say, okay, this WPF application is running on .NET Core 3.0, you can run it. But then if you have another one which is running on .NET Core 3.1 in a year, for example, you don't need to upgrade your PC to .NET Core 3.1 anymore. The, the application is going to contain everything it needs, so everything is going to run side by side. Now, in the future, I don't exclude the possibility that we will have a UI stack which is going to be universal as well. I, I don't know that. It's not Microsoft speaking here. It's my, my hope, okay? I don't know if that's coming. I have no clue. Nobody knows. But that would be cool. Though I'm not sure how, the, how it would work, to be honest, huh? because, uh, I mean, XAML already, I think we can forget it on Linux, so it would be to be something with another technology. That's the thing, right? That the, there's no UI in there's no UI. standards. And yeah. And core is just well, Correct. a runtime implementing one of those standards. Correct. And they just choose to run, implement a UI which yeah. is not part of the .NET standards. So Correct. That's why it's not. Right. Right. Exactly. So, so, that, so here for, for WPF and, w, and Windows Form running on .NET Core 3.0, the beauty is not really the cross-platform thing. The beauty is that you can have now side-by-side -side multiple versions of, um, of .NET Core, and so you don't, you don't have the problem of having to upgrade your whole PC to a new version of .NET anymore. So, you so it is a progress. Performance improvement too. Yes. Yeah, because the .NET Core engine is way faster than anything we had before, especially they did huge performance improvement because of the web, especially because on, uh, on website you, you are rated. I mean, the competition is huge, right, with other engines like Node or others, and so you need to be fast. And so they, they made it fast, which means that on the desktop we are going to basically benefit from that automatically. Can I add something about yeah. the type forwarder? Sure. So it's not an implementation, the .NET standard, class library, but it has metadata that's called a type forwarder. So what it'll do is it'll point to the API that's not implemented in the metadata and say that basically if you ask for this namespace, go to that namespace. Mm -hmm. And so it makes the metadata point to the right implementation of the API. So even though it's not implemented, when it's pulled into the platform that has system.threading, when it makes a system.threading call, it'll still forward to the correct namespace within that class library. Mm -hmm. That's how that works. So it's pretty clever, right? Cool. So, um, yeah. So, what I wanted to show is that now that I have MVVM Lite on .NET Standard, right, I told you a little bit the advantages. Mostly it was compatibility with other people who were already using .NET Standard. But now what I can do, I can go to .NET Core. So this time I'm going to .NET Core because I'm going to do an application. And I'm going to take a console application. I would love to create an application with UI running yeah. on .NET Core, but unfortunately that doesn't exist. So I'm going to do a console application instead. And I'm going to call it Core with MVM Lite, for example. Okay. And so now, this time I'm doing an application. So I go as high as I can, okay, .NET Core 2.1. That's cool because the platform that I'm going to run it on, I'm going to run it on Ubuntu and on Windows, those support .NET Core 2.1. In the past, when I started giving this presentation, Ubuntu was supporting only .NET Core 2.0, so I couldn't go to 2.1, I had to go back one. But like I told you, you start high with four applications and you go backward. For a class library, you start low and then you go up, okay? So here I select .NET Core 2.1, I'm good. 
So now we are going to build old style, old school uh, console application, right? So first of all, I'm going my console application. Let's imagine that it's a utility which needs to communicate with a web API somewhere, okay? And then let's imagine that I'm going to run this on servers uh, periodically and make sure that something is happening, okay? So I want to do things cleanly. So I'm going to add a new folder, call that module. Then I'm going to add an interface, uh, add new item. And I'm going to call that iData service. All right, make that public. And now this iData service is going to have one method called getResult. Now this method is going to be a stupid method, which is basically getting two integers, asking an Azure function to give back the result of an addition, uh, because you want an Azure function for that. Let's imagine, again, let's imagine that this is some, doing something meaningful, <laughs> such as, I don't know, getting information from an API and returning that, okay. So that's my, my interface. So now I will have- of, Should be string or int? Uh, that can be string in that case. It doesn't, in my application, it doesn't matter here. Um, and then what it returns is basically the function says uh, the result is and then the result. So I, I get a string back. Actually, no, it's not true. It returns some JSON in that case. <laughs> Sorry. No, it returns some JSON. That's why I get some JSON. And then so my iData service is returning the JSON. Okay. Uh, I have multiple functions that I use in different <laughs> presentations. Okay. So now I'm going to add an implementation to that. So let's add a new class. Data service, okay? And this implementation is going to implement iData service. And this is going to say, okay, in that case, I'm going to connect to a URL. This is a URL of the function. Notice that it's taking two placeholders, num1 and num2, so the first number and the second number. And then I'm going to use an HTTP client to call get string async, which is asynchronous, so I need to make this async. And then I'm going to take the URL, replace the, play, the first placeholder with the first number that I'm getting into my, fun, into my method, and the second placeholder, and then I return whatever comes back from the function. Super simple. But of course, here I'm using HTTP client, so if I want to test that, for example, in a unit test, that could be an issue because maybe my service is not running, or basically, I want to have known conditions into an HTTP into a, a unit test, and calling a Azure function this is not a, this is not a known condition, right? Maybe the data center is down for some reason. So in that case, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to plan to have another implementation, which I call test data service, and this is also going to implement the same interface. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm coding what I told you before about the IOC container, that I have two implementation which all fulfill one interface. And this one is going to say, every time you call it, it's going to say, I don't know how to count, I'm just a test program. Basically it is a known value, okay? I'm getting something which I know, all right. So now I have one interface with two implementations. That sounds like a good scenario for an IOC container, okay. So here in my program, into my console app, I'm going to say, first of all, I'm going to ask the user, what do you want to do? Do you want to use a test service or the real service? I'm going to get the result. If the result is one, I'm going to say, all right, every time that somebody asks for an iData service, please give them a test data service. And then in case the result is two, every time that someone asks for an iData service, please give them a data service. All right. Now, of course, to do that, I need simple IOC. So the good thing is that I'm into, an, into a .NET Core application. I have a .NET standard version of the simple IOC. I just created it before. So I can go and add a dependency. Now, in reality, I would go on NuGet and pull the .NET standard version of MVVM Lite. But here, I'm just going to add a reference, go and browse. Actually, I have it here already because I, you know, I tend to try my demos before I go to talk to a group of people. So here, I already did that before. So now I have access to simple IOC. All right, this is good. Now I'm going to get the two numbers that my user wants to, to use. So first operand, second operand. 
And then I'm going to compute. And so just to make things a little bit more interesting, I said I'm not going to do the call here, but I'm going to go into another part of my application. So in a real application, you have multiple components. And then in one component, you ask things from the user. In another component, you run them, you know, so it's kind of decoupled, OK? And so here, the beauty is that I can say here, I have simple IOC where I register my data service, but I'm going to use it into another class, which is here. And here I'm going to say in this class, I'm going to get the iData service from simple IOC. I don't know what I'm getting. I don't know if I am getting a test data service or a data service. Here in this particular class, in this particular component, I don't care. I just want to call get results. That's all that matters to me. OK? You see the decoupling, right? So that's kind of the idea. So now I'm on Windows. Can I test my application? Yes, of course. I'm going to press Control F5. OK, let's try. So let's do two for the real service. I'm going to enter 30 and 12. And of course, the result is after a short wait. So now it's going, oh, the result is 42, which is correct because it's the answer to life, uh, the universe, and everything. In addition, I get uh, an information about the time on the server because why not? Uh, by the way, you should know that uh, this is interesting. Why is it in February 19? Oh, yeah, that's today, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused in time zones. Yes. <laughs> it is. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So basically, it's working fine. Good. So now let's try things again, but this time with the test service. OK, so I enter this. And now it says, I don't know how to count. I'm just a test program. My application is running. So now your boss comes and says, hey, you have this cool uh, Windows utility that is running great. But now we are putting all our servers on Linux. Can you implement a version of that on Linux? And you say, yes, I need six months. And then you do it in 10 minutes. And then you take five months and the rest of vacation, which is great. Because basically, you already did the work. This is already a .NET Core application, right? So in order to run it on Linux, I'm going to go and click on Publish here. What it does is basically it just gathers everything it needs to run them. I'm going to publish to a folder, which is here. So basically, it's building in release mode. And now that it's done, I can go to my folder. And if I go into bin release.NET Core App to one publish, you see that it has everything it needs. It has my DLL. It has galasoft.mvvmi.std.dll, so basically everything I need to run this application. So now you take it. I'm going to put it in C just so that it's a little bit easier to access. And now I can try on Linux. So here I'm on Windows. The cool thing is that on Windows, I have Ubuntu that I can run. So I don't know if you're familiar with that. This is something called the Windows subsystem for Linux. Basically, it's not an, emu it's not an emulator, right? It is actually Linux running on uh, Windows. And here I have installed Ubuntu. So if you go into the Windows Store, you have multiple distributions that you can get, depending what you prefer. Personally, I like Ubuntu. So here I'm running Bash. And I can say, let's cd to forward slash, because I'm on Linux. MNT, this is just a shortcut into my Windows file uh, system, slash c slash publish. All right, I can do ls to show you the, con the content. So basically, I'm running the Linux commands. And now I can say .NET core with mvvmlight.dll. And because I, installed, because I installed .NET core on this version of Linux, I can run it. And now we see exactly the same program. So if I press 2, for example, 12 and 30, after a short wait, we'll see that it will come back. So basically, I'm running exactly the same code. I'm using HTTP client. I'm running uh, async and await. OK, I'm not sure why it's taking so long, but it should be back at some point. Here we go, all right? So basically, I run exactly what I had on Windows. I can test it on Windows. I can run it on Linux. I can develop on Linux, test on Linux, run it on Windows, anything you want, right? That's the beauty of the cross-platform version, OK? Cool. So in summary, I'm running a little bit long, but it's because those guys never stop talking. So um, by the way. <laughs> All right. So the first thing that I want to show you, when you start thinking about converting your applications to .NET Core 
or basically to migrate from any version of .NET to any version of .NET, there is a portability analyzer. This is a great tool that you can install and then you basically point it to your DLL and then it's going to give you a full report telling you this API that you're using is not available in .NET standard 1.0, but it is available in .NET standard 1.2, for example. So before you even start to do the, the, the portability, you can already know what is expecting you. So it's a great way to get started. Now I have a few resources. There is an overview of .NET standard. The uh, .NET Core web application in Linux that I showed you, it's actually a sample that we have on Azure. So you can go and run it from there. It is explained step by step how to do it. MVVMLite.NET standard and a description of the portable class libraries in case you still want to do it. You shouldn't, right? Try to move away from that. But of course, it is linked with effort, I understand. Everything you need will be at this URL. You will have the slides, uh, the links to the repos, uh, the short videos that I showed you. And uh, I'll probably link also a recording of uh, what we record right now. Like this, you'll have everything there. That's about it. If you have questions, I'll take them. But if not, thank you very much. There is still some cold pizza, I guess, and uh, cold beer, I hope. <laughs> thank you for your attention.